uh, Professor Yang Feng Lu is a professor at the University of Nebraska since 2002. He is the uh, lot distinguished professor of engineering at this university. He has a bachelor degree in uh, Qinghua. Sorry for my Qinghua. Yeah, that's right. Qinghua <laughs> University in mm -hmm. China, and also a master in PhD from Osaka University in Japan. He is a, a world expert in the uh, laser micro nano processing of materials uh, for a number of years, uh, for uh, many decades that I know him, for uh, he is uh, one of the key experts in the world on this. He is fellow of many organizations, OSA, SPIE, IAPLE, and uh, he has received recently the Shallow Award of Laser Industrial Application. So he will be presenting a, a talk Sorry, I don't, I don't. Okay, I don't okay. Yes. Your, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then. Yes, the spectrally, specially, and temporally controlled laser processing and characterization. It covers many large, uh, broad application of materials. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Lucia, for your kind introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. You know, I know uh, Professor Manu for more than 30 years. I still remember that the first time when we met was in Tokyo, Japan, and uh, after conference, we had dinner together. So that time, you know, uh, you know I, I was very impressed by, first of all, I was very impressed by uh, his work and uh, his presentation, and also his kind of like a very visionary view about the area. So that's why we see uh, from the Manu transformed from uh, uh, semiconductors all the way to the kind of what he is doing. And uh, I had a pleasure to read his papers over the early years and uh, learn a lot from his ideas um, about you know, the, how to integrate laser nanotechnology with uh, biomedical applications. So uh, I think, you know, I think the last in uh, uh, Montreal is not so far away in terms of uh, distance. And I uh, took like a, for me, I'm really afraid, it was a great pleasure that I uh, took me many, many years. I uh, finally I got time to come here to uh, to visit uh, your lab and to learn from you. Thank you, Michelle, for all your arrangements. And thank you for the attending. And also, I thank the audience from the Zoom uh, to listen to us. And if you have any uh, feedback, and just send us a, a message, and uh, I'd be happy to, you know, to, you know, to answer your questions. So, um, so we have been doing quite a few things in uh, in uh, start from my career in, in at National University of Singapore, and then uh, you know uh, later at the uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln in the U.S. So uh, we have to we will try to look at what lasers can can be used for different applications. So then our interest is pretty wide, uh, ranging from like you know. Uh, as large as uh, uh, naval ships, as small as uh, nanoparticles and uh, graphing layers. So, uh, so lasers are just amazing, and we can do so many things. I'd like to share with you because we have really you know world leading uh, activities in the laser material interactions here. Um, so, just you know, a few areas we'd like to introduce today. Certainly, you know, we have uh, some other areas going on. So if you have interest, you'd be uh, happy to, to answer all your questions. You can send to uh, your question to my email address here, uh, yau 2 at una.edu. That's my email address. Uh, please feel free to send me any questions. OK, uh, just introduction uh, where we are. Probably you know, for people from Canada, we don't have to introduce because uh, where Nebraska is is pretty, you know, I think pretty, probably known in, in Canada. But in other part of the world, we have to tell them where Nebraska is. And uh, uh, we have a group called Laser Assisted Nano Engineering Laboratory, uh, Lane Lab. Uh, so we have um, students from all over the world. And one thing is that you know I'm really uh, proud of. We have started um, uh, collaboration with the University of Bordeaux in France in the past like 10 to 15 years. Uh, so we have. You know, I'm familiar with French culture. So to me, 
I cannot speak French, but I, you know, to me, it's always like a pleasure to listen to other people speak French. I kind of pick up a few words like, you know, uh, merci beaucoup, c'est mon plaisir. <laughs> yeah, and uh, also, uh, 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 I learned that, you know, actually one year uh, when I was in a college in a, it's called a uh, Francais Scientifique Technique. <laughs> That's uh, all about the reading, not uh, about the speaking. So but I think it's uh, necessary to learn more about this, how to speak French. And um, uh, so we had really a uh, uh, great group of members uh, in the past like uh, 30 years. And uh, so our philosophy is try to integrate material processing um, and uh, micro uh, and nano fabrication as well as spectroscopy and imaging and combine them together. That means, you know, we want to know what material to use, what the structure to make, and what kind of functionalities we try to achieve. And then eventually, because there's so many data involved, for example, taking imaging as an example, we have a 3D for space. We have uh, another dimension for uh, chemistry. You have uh, vibrational modes, you have many things you can put it in one dimension. And also you have a temporal change because the, the phenomenon like a medical, like a response, for example, how the cells are light and uh, structures response to uh, light is uh, very uh, time sensitive. So we, at least we have 5D. And the human brains are not very good in processing any information beyond 3D, unfortunately, and we are probably up to the limit of like 3D. If you have 4D space, probably it's hard for us to uh, deal with. So that's why we need a, uh, artificial intelligence, AI or machine learning to deal with big data and then extract information our brains can uh, appreciate. That's that kind of like a philosoph philosophy for our research. And uh, also I have two charts I'd like to share with uh, everyone when I talk with, how lucky we are to live in the current you know, uh, time. And just uh, this is a, a chart for um, probably for audience from uh, the Zoom, it's better to use this later point here. So this is a chart to see the resolution human can uh, achieve in microscopy. And uh, uh, you know, like, you know, probably like a 40, uh, 400 years ago, we didn't have uh, material science. We cannot make transparent glasses. You know, even making glasses, it's, it's, it's a great deal because uh, we cannot make pure materials to have a very high quality glasses. That's why we didn't have optics. And once we had glasses and we start, people start to use optics to develop like a single lenses and then to have a more complicated uh, uh, microscopes. But that time we consider light as a, a ray, right? We have ray optics. So we have a straight lines of uh, 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 light rays. So we didn't have, you know, didn't have understanding about the physics of light. So that's why we can only uh, make um, uh, simple uh, microscopes. This is kind of optical microscopy from 1700 to 1800, 100 years. They didn't have any improvement in the resolution because uh, we didn't know that light is a wave. And then from 1800, we start to know that the light is a wave. And then we can have a wavefront engineering in optics, and we can improve in 100 years, we can improve by a factor of 10. So it's one, one uh, uh, you know, big jump of uh, by understanding physics. And then we have a quantum uh, revolution. So from like a, you know, uh, uh, early part of 19th uh, 20th century, so we start to use electrons as a media to observe the uh, microscopic world. Suddenly, we see a uh, three, uh, you know, one thousand times improvement in fifty years. So in our lifetime, we have experienced 
probably your younger generation who is not, but at least for our generation, we have experienced from a micro scale resolution to nano scale resolution, just a one solid times improvement in 50 years. And uh, I'm pretty sure that in the future generations, probably it's not going to experience uh, another uh, solid times improvement because we don't know what's the end like uh, and happen, right? And that's something I think uh, very, very interesting to think about. Then whether our future generations can experience any type of uh, uh, improvement in the resolution. Talk about uh, the space, how we observe the space at the microscopic world. And now we have another aspect and which was uh, um, given by uh, a Nobel laureate uh, Prokhorov is a Russian scientist, and he got Nobel Prize uh, 60 years ago. Um, and he gave a talk about his view about, you know, how light can interact with materials. And uh, he said that uh, a, sweep, a sweep frequency, that means the tunable lasers from our current terminology, if we have wavelength tunable lasers, then we can uh, uh, control the uh, chemical reactions. So different bonds will be excited and the chemical reactions will take place in certain directions. So that's something we really liked like 20 years ago and we put a lot of effort to how to use laser to control chemical reactions to achieve the uh, results we prefer. For example, we can burn we can burn gas, we can burn wood to get a fire, get the heat at all like furnaces and uh, in, in a stove. And usually after burning, you get a suit to, or if you are burning, it's not complete, you get a suit or get a graphite. But can we burn the gases to get a diamond? That's something we explored in the past like 20 years. And the answer, yes, yes, we can burn things to get diamond. But then we have to control the chemical reactions very precisely, because diamond is a metastable material. It's a, usually it's hard to get, right? Otherwise, you know, when we have engagement in the rings, we won't use diamond anymore if diamond is as cheap as glasses. So diamond is still very hard to get. That's why diamond is precious. Um, so he believed that a revolution of a series of branches in uh, chemical industry, that I think uh, hasn't happened in the past like a half century. We didn't see a lot of like things in how laser uh, in, you know, uh, contribute or interfere with chemical reactions in, at industrial levels. And because my personal belief is that that time, and since, uh, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, lasers were not Powerful. So the latest are developed is being developed like computers. And you just think about the computers half a century ago, it was just, you know, from current to standard point of view, it's just a uh, rubbish, right? 50 years ago, a computer, no one can use that other than a toy. And uh, lasers also has happened in the same way. Lasers are being developed year by year, and we have a lot of uh, new functionalities, and then we even have uh, smart lasers, because if you look at the fiber lasers, you can put a lot of structures, a lot of uh, functionalities on fibers to get a new type of lasers. So I believe that this is kind of like dawn of uh, what uh, uh, Prohoff pro predict, and uh, we hope that we can uh, do something in this area. That's that's kind of like a, the philosophy uh, drive our research uh, in the, in the, in the past like twenty years. Okay, um, and then you know. Just uh, for chemical reactions, we have a uh, electronic level of excitation. And also, so we have uh, interbands and intrabands excitations. And interbands usually is in UV or visible uh, uh, range. And uh, intrabands, they are usually in far infrared ranges. So if we can control the uh, energy excitations in the molecules, in different ways, and they can behave differently, and then they can, you know, we can control the chemistry, uh, which are, uh, you know, inv involving these kind of molecules. Oh, 
what happened before it could come. Okay, yeah, that's great. And uh, so one example is that now we use a, a wavelength CO2, uh, wavelength tunable CO2 lasers to control the combustion of gases and to gain different kind of chemical reactions. And we can use this uh, approach to grow diamond, to grow gamma nitride, and to grow uh, boron top diamond and nitrogen top diamond. So some materials, they really, you know, uh, show a big difference when we use uh, uh, lasers to control the vibration or uh, electronic uh, uh, status of the molecules. And uh, in terms of imaging, uh, we have been doing research on uh, laser-based uh, uh, medical diagnosis. And so it's an imaging, and we talk about more about the four-dimensional imaging because we want to add chemical information into the uh, medical images. Then we can extract more information. For example, in the early uh, screening of cancers, because the cancers, when you see the morphological changes in tissues, usually you no, know, it's a bit too late. So we want to have earlier signals of cancers. Then chemical information can be very useful, and which can you know uh, find cancers uh, at much earlier early stage. And for the fabrication, so you know we are doing nanoscale fabrications using light for like a. Uh, uh, Two photon polymerization, uh, multi, uh, uh, multi photon effects. And uh, so we can program the chemical reactions. For example, one example is that we can just uh, using simple two dimensional uh, scanning methods scan the laser in the polymer. But since we program the level of polymerization, then their mechanical properties can be programmed and they can, you know, we can produce very complicated shapes in. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, 3D scanning. Usually, laser 3D scanning are program, uh, and you, you need a very complicated uh, program to write 3D structures. But using this method, we can simplify the computer-based programming and using chemistry to generate uh, structures we need by programming the chemistry rather, uh, rather than programming the dimensions. And and then you, all this kind of controllability gave us the nanoscale uh, uh, accuracy and nanos, nanoscale uh, dimensions. And the one areas we have been uh, we have been uh, try uh, try to uh, driving is uh, the making the targets for uh, nuclear fusion because you know uh, probably you have heard of nuclear fusion is uh, is picking up the momentum and. Uh, uh, and the US government has an ambitious plan to have commercial use of nuclear fusion energy in 10 years' time. So, uh, you know, certainly it's 10 years, whether it's 10 years is exactly the 10 years, we don't know, but at least, you know, we can see that uh, uh, the private uh, sectors are starting to uh, invest invest into the nuclear fusion energy, uh, that's called IP, uh, uh, inertial fusion energy because that's a ultimate source of energy for humans. We don't really uh, are limited. We want to be limited by the uh, resources and uh, we don't have to concern about uh, the uh, the pollution if uh, the fusion energy can be a solution to, to our uh, civilization. And uh, also, you know, just show that uh, our range of our work. And we propose a concept of shipyard on the ship and uh, because on the shipyard, uh, on, the sh on ships, there are a lot of metal structures. One common material is uh, aluminum alloys. And because aluminum alloys are affordable, are light, are strong, but they degrade with time. And uh, we need to use laser to make sure that the degradation, and there's one process called synthesization. Uh, we don't have time to talk to details, but we can, now we can use laser to reverse the aging of uh, aluminum alloys and then to repair the uh, the uh, metal works on ships rather than sending the ships to the shipyard. That can save a tremendous amount of time and uh, and a cost because you know we don't have to schedule uh, 
shipyard maintenance. Probably you have experience of sending your cars to uh, you know, workshops. You have to make calls and you have to pay money to the technicians. And also, you know, you lose your usage while you're sending the, your uh, cars to the to the to the uh, shipyard uh, to the workshops. And shipyards, you know, you know, it's much more complicated process and it's much more costly and time consuming to send ships to the shipyard. And um, so this is uh, one example, very simple. Uh, you know, outlook for the for the shape of the machine is very simple. But since it's a uh, fiber-based lasers, fiber as uh, just mentioned, this, fiber based lasers are very becoming very smart. They are computer controlled, computer programmable. So we can do many things just under one machine. For example, we can do uh, cutting, we can do welding, we can do annealing, we can do one process we call it desensitization, how to reverse aging of uh, aluminum alloys using the same machine. So we can do many things. So for small scale uh, problems on ships, you don't need to send ships to the uh, shipyard. In, instead, we have just have like a portable, uh, you know, we design the whole system uh, below 100 pounds. So including lasers, control of everything, including uh, below 100 pounds. So the two guys can really carry this uh, system uh, around to, to repair ships. So that makes the metal work on ships much faster and much more cost effective. And this is just a one demonstration uh, a few years back in a, in a uh, naval shipyard. Okay, so uh, let's start some like, uh, you know, examples. I know that, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Manu's group is very famous in uh, uh, nano laser technology in biomedical applications. And uh, so we have been focusing on the uh, early screening of disease, uh, disease using laser-based uh, uh, approaches. So one um, uh, area is what we call the chemical imaging, because when you talk with doctors and many other people, if you tell them whatever spectroscopy, they don't like it. But if you tell them chemical imaging, then uh, they like this uh, name quite uh, you know uh, easily. And uh, so we you know, we just you know uh, add a name called a uh, chemical imaging, and so uh, it's basically it's just a three dimensional uh, uh, microscopy plus one dimensional chemical information. Uh, so the central approach we use is a uh, uh, current anti drama spectroscopy. And this is a, a four wave mixing technology. Uh, so basically we can use uh, two different wavelengths. And uh, uh, if you put them together, then these two different wavelengths start to have a, a kind of mixture of wavelengths and forming a beating frequency. And this beating frequency is uh, much lower than the original frequency. Usually, you know, of uh, film signal lasers are like uh, having wavelengths of uh, 800 nanometer to one micrometer. And if you put them together uh, with difference in the small difference in the uh, frequency, then we can form a beating frequency, which is in far infrared, like a 10 micrometer or like a 20 micrometer. And this wavelength is just nice to excite the molecular vibrations. And uh, so what we are doing here is uh, we have these uh, two waves to form a beating frequency. And this technology is very similar to FM radio, frequency modulated radio. I don't know how many of you have experience with FM radio. Probably on all the cars, if you have FM radio, for the most you know, our younger generation, we have iPods, we have iPhones, probably not many people are using FM radio anymore. So FM radio is to using the like a 80 megahertz kind of a, a high uh, radio frequency to carry the human voice. Like a, usually, you know, well, audible frequencies like a, a few hundred K, uh, a few thousand to probably 10, 10 K, depends on, you know, uh, who we are talking about. So uh, usually a few, a few kilohertz. So we can use, uh, megahertz uh, electromagnetic wave to carry kilohertz signals. It's a similar here. So we are using uh, near infrared, like a one micrometer, to carry 
the information of uh, 10 micrometers. And then these 10 micrometers can be used to resonate certain molecules uh, in very complex like tissue, right? And uh, let's say if you have tissue, you know, tissues are very complicated, you know, biological materials are very complicated. And then you have a lot of molecules inside. And then we did try to see the biochemical information in the tissues. It's very complicated and usually you lose a lot of information. And what we're trying to see is uh, we are looking at just one specific molecule. Let's say if the physics of tissue is being you know, uh, studied better and better, then we can use um, this method to have one type of molecules be mapped out in the 3D space. And uh, certainly we can map many kinds of uh, molecules, whatever molecules in, in theory, and you can map them out in 3D space and use this information to uh, link to the different kind of diseases like cancers or, or some you know, muscle degradations. Um, then, you know, in this four wave mixing, then we have another is pump uh, line, pump wavelengths, and the pump wavelengths will start to pick up vibration information from the excited molecules and then provide anti-stock information. So basically, it's vibrational spectroscopy, same as Raman. So we call it anti stock Raman because Raman, usually we are uh, taking signals which which have uh, like, you know, a photon um, taken the vibration information away. But this one is we are adding the vibration information onto the photonic energy and the photon usually have short wavelengths and then the anti stock signals we can be free from like a background, be before some kind of like background information. So, and also this is a coherent uh, excitation. The um, efficiency is like a 1 million times higher than spontaneous Rama. So in Rama, it takes like minutes and hours to take a spectrum. This one, we only need like a millisecond to accumulate a spectrum. Now with this kind of like a fast speed, we can scan them in the in the 3D. And uh, uh, usually you know, we use a uh, laser source with 80 megahertz. Uh, that means that each second we are taking 80 million uh, spectra. Now you can put all the 3D spectra when you scan the laser beam and we, you, you can do the uh, 3D chemical imaging of uh, like a tissues and other materials. And we develop this um, um, system and this is the, uh, the configuration and this hardware. And uh, so one example is, uh, you know, the first example actually in uh, like a 10, probably uh, 15 years ago. And we succeeded in imaging RG cells because at that time the US government, like the DOE, Department of Energy, had a strong interest to produce uh, oil, produce a uh, biofuel from uh, uh, biomass like uh, glasses and uh, and uh, algae. Algae, you can see algae can grow very fast in the water, and uh, soon algae they can produce lipids, but the biochemists they don't know where the lipids is coming from, and we help them to image the cells, algae cells, live algae cells, and show that at the lipids are existing in the um, in the uh, inside of the cell because some people, some biochemists propose that uh, the lipids, the oil, are in the walls of algae, and then we show that actually they are in the they are the uh, in inside of us. You know, they have like a, like almost like a beans. Uh, you know, they have like droplets of oils inside of the algae cells, and also. We can, because it's chemical information, we can have filtering of different like, wavelengths and then look at different uh, type of chemistry. So this is a lipid, and this is a chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is kind of a greenish star in the in the in the uh, in the uh, algae cells. So that just one the first example that we succeed in using cast imaging to solve or to address a biological problem, and. Uh, the uh, cost is a, is a confocal microscopy. 
So we can have 3D uh, imaging by sectioning different layer layers. This is a, a pollen. Pollen is you know in the uh, springtime. You know if we have pollen, then uh, some people are allergic to pollen. So then we have like you know, uh, almost like a uh, cold type of uh, response to uh, pollen. And uh, one pollen has like a, a diameter of thirty micrometers. Then we can see that we can section the the uh, pollen very uh, uh, clearly um, to show the not chemical. Uh, structure and also uh, you know ge geographical or the, the, the you know uh, photometric information can be shown by this uh, confocal imaging. Um, this one can give us a lot you know uh, kind of like solutions in biomedical applications. This one is the uh, the information for uh, liver cells because uh, in the US, I think two thirds of the adults have a problem of. Uh, fat liver disease, uh, obesity, right? Different levels. I don't know whether Canada is better, but uh, uh, in most developed nations, I think we eat too much nutrition and we don't have uh, enough exercise. So we, we our fat is being accumulated in a different organs. So fat liver disease can lead to uh, uh, liver cancer. In, in, if it's a uh, you know, uh, long-term uh, without treatment, without a uh, uh, improvement. So this one, you can see that uh, the liver cells can be uh, uh, scanned, and also we can single out the fat in the liver cells. Otherwise, you know, if you don't use a uh, cast and you cannot see the uh, uh, fat in the in, inside liver cells. So this is a you know for mouse with low fat diet, diet. and if uh, we feed the uh, the uh, mouse with a high Fat diet, and uh, then you can see that the you know the fat particles grow, eventually break the liver cells, and uh, then the liver cells start to be broken, and the, it becomes hepatitis. And if this situation is lasting for a long time, and there's a risk of uh, uh, liver cancer. So now we can see the progress of uh, uh, fat liver disease. And because of the, you know, we have the ability to single out fat in the imaging, and we know how the fat is being formed, and we can, you know, know how the, you know, the fat can break the liver uh, structures and eventually lead to a uh, uh, disease. And this is one example we did. And also, you know, there's a peripheral artery disease. You know, when people are aging, the arteries, the blood vessels start to be blocked. And then, you know, if the block is at uh, the heart, then, you know, we can have the risk of heart attack. And if the blockage is at the legs and arms, limbs, then uh, they, they form a uh, peripheral artery disease. And the problem of uh, art for peripheral artery disease is that the, the muscles, these are the human muscle, and uh, the muscles can degrade. And to a certain level, they can recover. Then, you know, we have to cut over of the legs and arms, so the amputation is a kind of a very huge pain to the uh, patients and also to the surgeons is also a big stress because you know you have to make a judgment whether amputation is necessary because if you do this like a you know too early, then you know the, the patient lose their uh, mobility and the lifestyles. And if you do this too late, then it can be life threatening, and the patient can die from the you know, late operation. So it's very stressful for surgeons. And we need kind of like a criteria, scientific or, or uh, numerical criteria for doctors to decide when is a good timing to decide the amputation. Um, so we use a class and uh, then you know, we can uh, just one uh, image, we can take out different uh, chemical types of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the muscle. And uh, the class is showing the, um, the uh, fat. And uh, the second half of generation is showing the fibers of the, of the, uh, of the uh, muscles. And so, uh, school photon uh, excited fluorescence showing the 
proteins of uh, uh, the muscle. So we have different uh, uh, chemical information can be obtained by this system, not only the uh, morphology of the the the, uh, the muscles. And this one is a you know damage. Uh, you can see that you know not only the structures are being changed, and the chemi chemical information is also being changed. And this is a severe damaged. So now with this kind of uh, information, we may know one thing that we can start to observe the uh, like you know the symptom of uh, uh, PAD earlier, and uh, uh, also we can provide a, a numerical data, computational data to doctors to help them to decide when is a good timing for amputation, not too early, not too late, and. Uh, this is one uh, another example, and also we worked on the uh, the breast cancers, and breast cancers are pretty common disease among humans, and uh, especially for uh, you know aged women, and uh, this is a kind of a uh, quite quite a common disease. So, and what we did was uh, how to see the like you know there is a one issue is a uh, for operation to remove the tumors from a uh, breast. Uh, uh, from breast, and then where the boundary is, that's kind of a big question for doctors. If you cut too much, that's burden to the patients. If I to cut too too little, then there's uh, another risk of like you know uh, coming back. The cancers can come back, and so we need to see the very uh, um, light uh, information about very small information about the. Uh, the cancer. So what we did was uh, to single out the blood vessels in breast uh, tissues, and uh, because of the morphology and density of the breast, uh, uh, the, the blood vessels is uh, a direct uh, association to the cancers. So this is a normal say, uh, normal tissue, and this is a uh, uh, the cancer tissue. You can see that uh, in the cancer tissue the Blood vessels are much denser, and they have much have much sharp edges and much sharp sharp ends. That's kind of sign of uh, uh, of um, uh, breast uh, the breast cancer. Okay, and then we also worked on the um, the pancreatic cancer, and uh, so pancreatic cancer. Uh, so one type of um, collagen can be observed by the uh, the cast imaging and. Uh, so this is the left side is normal uh, uh, pancreatic uh, organization, and the right side is for uh, cancer, cancerous uh, uh, the uh, the organs of, of pancreatic uh, structures, and this is quite different. And but uh, this when we see this kind of difference, usually you know it's pretty like a, a stage two, stage three. It's sometimes too late for the patient to be like cured. So we did earlier level of um, uh, information to save the patients. So we do just a surface enhanced drama. Probably drama is very popular. So what we did uh, is to click off all the drama spectra. And uh, because drama spectra usually have like one solid channels, wavelength channels, depending on the resolution of your spectrometers, you can add more. Then, you know, for when you scan them, then you have a uh, three one solid dimensions of the information, so you have one solid dimension of data cubes, right? And that's too much for human brains. That's why we use a com you know computer computation using uh, machine learning, and to uh, reduce there's one method called PCA. So basically, is to reduce information to lower dimensions. For example, you know. That's our human body. We have a lot of dim uh, dimensions on our human body, but uh, you know it's too complicated to get every all the details. You can say, oh, this guy is tall, this guy is uh, short, this guy is you know uh, uh, you know big or small. So so we can adding a lot like you know uh, information to combine them into one dimension. So then the whole process is mathematically how to reduce dimensions of uh, uh, of data. To make the still representative to the to the information. For example, one example is uh, what is uh, weather like in Montreal, right? 
And uh, so weather has a lot of information, but you can see, okay, temperature, you can see with the shiny, with the snow, probably you can have a few simple dimensions that can represent the roughly the information of the, uh, the uh, uh, weather here. So similarly, the, like we have one sort of dimensions of the uh, information, but eventually we, what we need to know is uh, which stage is the cancer, right? No cancer, stage zero, stage one, all the way to stage four, how to classify them into groups. That's the, that's the purpose. So in terms of that, let's say for the weather, we can say, okay, normal weather, bad weather, very great weather. So probably we only need three types of weather to, to talk about. Then, you know, the, the job becomes simpler because what we need to is just to, how to reduce, uh, usually how to reduce uh, uh, dimensions to from 1,000 to probably around like below 10. So when they have dimensions below 10, computers can handle pretty nicely. And then you can help them to find the boundaries and then eventually it can tell you the you know, uh, level of disease. And which which can make really this uh, uh, process can make the uh, uh, diagnosis of uh, uh, disease at a much earlier stage because the you know, chemical information helps us a lot. And, uh, and now we are looking at uh, coronary artery disease, heart attack, CAD, and uh, we succeeded in the first uh, test and we can extract you know, uh, information from blood and uh, to tell the risks of the risk and uh, of the heart attack and uh, it's pretty uh, higher uh, fidelity, higher uh, uh, accuracy. So now we are getting uh, one grant from uh, AHA, American Heart As uh, Association, to make this method more like established, uh, hopefully eventually can be used for uh, for uh, clinical applications. Because uh, one thing is that you know, in order to understand the risk of a heart attack, we have to do like a very complicated uh, diagnosis, like a, you know uh, uh, what the shadow shadowgraphy. So uh, it takes time and takes uh, uh, money to do that this kind of uh, diagnosis. Now, if we have we can tell the risk from blood, then we have an annual. A uh, health checkup, we can do uh, the uh, uh, test, you know, just by blood work. So it's much easier to uh, to uh, save the lives of a heart attack because, um, you know, heart attacks are a very high risk in uh, among the population, especially for people in the U.S. and probably Canada is, has similar uh, lifestyles. Okay, um, so these are the things, you know, we have been doing. Um, then, you know, uh, this is a kind of medical application, so it's probably not uh, really a uh, uh, big like uh, area. Uh, by comparing with either what you are doing here, um, let me see if I need to. Hopefully, it's charging. Yeah. My, my apologies. Let's just make sure. Oh, it's not. It's been charged. Okay, now it's been charged. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, uh let me just make sure. Okay, um so for any application, so basically you know, we are looking at the different uh, stages of uh, any application from the um from generation, transportation, storage, and consumption. Um I try to not to you know cover all everything, but uh, one example is that you know uh, we can Generated electricity by com simple combustion, rather than you know uh, going through very complicated um, systems. If if you go to really rural areas, you need uh, some uh, power like a few kilowatts for like you know a uh, satellite for whatever kind of equipment because it's costly to pull the energy wise to all the lo locations. So we can use this kind of system. So basically, you can just burn a flame and use, use a magnetic field to extract electrons and ions, and then you can generate electricity. It's a very simple method, but we need the materials which can stand for high temperature, high corrosivity, but yet it has to be thermally and electrically conductive. So this, we call it electrical materials. So we have generated uh, using carbon nanotube uh, matrix material, uh, composite material, we generate this kind of, uh, uh, 
uh, materials for this application. And also, you know, we have been doing um, diamond and copper composite materials to deal with the thermal issues because many systems, you know, if you associate with the energy, that has high temperature. So how to deal with uh, high temperature applications, you need a, uh, a material which can be tunable in thermal conductivity and tunable in uh, in thermal uh, in, in uh, uh, expansion coefficient have have make it a thermally conductive and mechan mechanically stable. Uh, so um, probably we don't have time to go through all the details. And uh, uh, how much time do I have? Maybe. No. Yeah, less than ten minutes. Okay. Okay. That's great. Then, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And for example, you know, we can use optical near field. This is something very close to you know your application, plasmonic applications, and uh, and then we can have a, a self-aligned growth of carbon nanotube to bridge the electrodes, and eventually we can make um, barometer or temperature uh, sensors at room temperature. Usually, barometers require cryogenic temperatures and uh, that's, that, that makes system uh, expensive and bulky. Now with this kind of approach, we can have um, uh, also plasmonic effect to concentrate the light into uh, the gap. And then we have a small uh, carbon nanotube bridging the gap. And if you have slight change of temperature because the thermal capacity of uh, Carbon nanotube is very low. If you have a little bit of energy going through this uh, carbon nanotube temperature will change. When you have high temperature, then you have uh, high photon scattering and the resistance will increase. So we have a very simple, but yet very sensitive uh, uh, metrology uh, method for measuring the temperature of the, uh, the environment. And uh, so let me just, uh, and also we have developed a method to grow graphing at uh, just in the uh, just in the environment in uh, you know without like vacuum vacuum chambers because uh, usually you know when you grow uh, graphene you have to use CVD then you need a graph uh, you need a vacuum chambers and uh, so what we did was to uh, um, use a special method is uh, um, using nickel and carbon so that's one you know if you look at nickel carbon phase diagram. There is a, a, a one um, phase which has lower melting uh, point. And then what we did here is just to make sure that the ratio of these two layers can form a phase in that lower melting temperature uh, regime, re region. And then you know we can just uh, bake this system and then uh, the nickel. And then actually, they form the nickel uh, uh, three carbon, and nickel three carbon start to evaporate, and then the the uh, remaining carbon will form uh, uh, graphene. That's 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 kind of method. okay. And this is one method. And also, you know, we are developing super lubricant using a carbon uh, structure called the carbon nano onions because carbon nano onions when you put it in the car and when you smear them. They form graphene, and we know graphene when they attach on the metals, and they can form very smooth, uh, frictionless la layers. So, so this uh, uh carbon nanotubes, if you put in the like oil engine in the cars, and they can form a uh, self repairing, uh, function, and also they can reduce the uh, uh friction and the oil consumption. So with this, you know, we calculate that we can save like a one percent to one point five. 1.5 percent of uh, gas uh, gasoline consumption in the U.S. Uh, you know, just to think about the overall how much uh, gas we are using. So that's kind of big saving for the economy. And uh, and now uh, the EVs are being developed in electric vehicles, and um, mostly we have to depend on the uh, battery charges, right? And there are issues that. Batteries. Well, for, first of all, we it takes time to like thirty minutes to charge, or even longer to charge, and that's a, that's hassle to our usage. And second thing that 
we have tons of uh, batteries being manufactured, being installed. And after 10 years, all this are becoming treacherous, become burden to us because how to deal with the wasted batteries, right? We have tons of wasted batteries and which can be a burden to our environment. So we have to reduce the usage of batteries. So one method is being built is a wireless charging. So you have antennas built in the in 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 the road. So when your car moving on the road and the car can receive uh, uh energy from the coils uh embedded in 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 the in the in the uh road. And but the problem is that you know when you have high frequency antenna, and we know that antenna has a uh, eddy current has positive effect. They are having this kind of a you know useless energy, which is being used to heat the coil, heat the antenna. Then one is that you are, you are reducing your energy efficiency. And second thing is that you know you are um uh, and heating up the coil, and you have to have uh, uh the water cooling system. So if you're putting water cooling system, it's expensive and it's a, it's hassle to uh to use technology. So what we did was uh using carbon nanotubes to confine the motion of current on the surface of coils and then make this uh, system much has much lower eddy currents. And uh, then the coil can trans, uh, transmit more uh, energy without heating up. That's kind of uh, applications. Okay, and um, this is one probably we don't have a lot of time to discuss, but uh, I'd like to show you that, that, that you know, this is a, a part that we use for laser fusion. And so we need, because laser fusion, you know, we have to squeeze the uh, deuterium and tritium to a, from like a one millimeter to 30 micrometer. This is called an implosion. And uh, so, you know, probably, you know, NIF uh, is a uh, uh, one largest facility in the US, probably in the world in, in terms of laser fusion. Uh, the problem is that, you know, you know, I always said that thing that the laser fusion is like squeezing an egg to a small size without breaking the shell, right? If you have you squeeze a, an egg, if you break it, and then all the you know, stuff inside it will just jump out and the fusion cannot happen. So we need to accurately uh, fabricate a carbon, which means a uh, the, the solid shell inside. And also we need a, a buffer layer outside. Let's say if we have a, an A, if you put a you know a buffer like a wrap wrapping like bubbles outside, the shell of the eggs are much difficult to break. So similarly we put a, a form outside and this form is only like a you know, 40 to uh, 80 milligrams per square uh uh cubic centimeter so it's like a five percent of uh, water water uh weight so it's very uh low density form so and it's a uh, uh shape has to be in nanoscale accurate and, and smooth because it has slightly change in the structure the improvement of fit so so we have to do this kind of fabrication in the past uh, 15 years so we need to overcome a lot of barriers, materials, structural, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, also you, know, you have to have the temporal response to laser, uh, laser shooting. You have, you have like 160, 176 laser squeezer for for not small size. That's kind of a crazy requirements. And eventually you know, we were able to make this kind of uh, uh, structures using laser 3D printing. Okay, um, probably we just are going to another one is, uh, uh, you know, diamond growth, as you know, is, is a very complicated process. And uh, we were able to use this method to use laser to tune the uh, molecules in the flame, molecular vibration in the flame, and uh, then uh, kill the, this chemical reaction to form diamond rather than to form like the graphite and soot, because graphite and soot are very easy to form. And uh, if you burn anything, you get graphite and soot, right? And uh, look at environment, you know, 
it's not so easy because whenever we see anything in the phone, a wood to get down. Otherwise, the time could be very uh, affordable. Um, so with the right wavelengths to excite the right mode, came, uh, the vibration mode of came, uh, molecules like you know acetylene, for example, then we can get a very high quality diamond, like diamond uh, crystals. And even we can use a wavelength to control the diamond orientation. So you can get a one, one, one surfaces, or you can get a one zero zero surfaces with this kind of controllability. And also we overcome the one big issue is that diamond has very short bands. So if you try to uh, diffuse something, and diamond will just disappear. Diamond structure will be, be, be damaged. Um, so it's very hard to top diamond. Otherwise, diamond electronics is very good, great electronics because diamond is very stable. And uh, so now with the vibration node control, we can incorporate the like, uh, nitrogen and the borons into the diamond lattice to form a uh, very well structured diamond lattice with dopants, then you know it open up, opens up a way to grow uh, materials, diamond materials for electronics. That's something you know uh, is happening here. Okay, so um, I'm sure that you know uh, we have a limit on the time. So let's um, just go to the conclusion, and then we can take a few questions. Um, um, so one area we skipped is kind of a you know we can use laser to generate structures which can be used for environmental applications. And uh, let's just look at the, um, the conclusion. Uh, okay, you know, first of all, lasers are very first type, which is very powerful. We can control the chemical physical reactions in uh, energy, in space and in time. And then we can use this to control the materials reactions in 1D, 2D, 3D. And also, you know, we can do uh, growth integration and functionalization using lasers. And also we can use uh, uh, laser for characterization. It can be structural, can be chemical. And the one thing we did, uh, didn't have time to cover is uh, isotopic, because if you have a, you know, a nuclear type of uh, applications, and you have isotopes. Actually, medical also have isotopes. Okay. For example, when we try to study the formation of uh, uh, fat disease, so we have to take the uh, nutrition to the bodies. But uh, the nutrition of the body and all original body fat, they're the same. So, but uh, if you have deuterized fat to be like, uh, fed into, into uh, to the mouses, so we can know how the external nutrition are being dieted by the uh, by the uh, the organs, and eventually they form like you know uh, the fat into the body. So we can know the external fat and the internal fat by putting uh, isotopic marks into the molecules. So you know there are just tremendous uh, I think uh, application we can expect from later applications. Certainly, you know uh, Dr. Manu's group is kind of a. Uh, Start group in a biomedical application. So hopefully, you know, we can learn more from uh, uh, your activities and uh, uh, potentially we can have some coverage in the future. Thank you very much for your attention.